Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today uh, for this webinar. As pointed out, my name is Bill Brannon. I'm one of two technical leads for the DuraCloud project employed by DuraSpace. And today we're just going to be walking through some of the main technical points and the, the structure that allows DuraCloud to, to work as it does. So just to give us a brief overview of what we're going to be talking about today, we'll of course start with an introduction about what it is that DuraCloud uh, is and what we're going to discuss. And then we'll jump right into the, the building blocks that make up DuraCloud being storage services reporting and the user interface. Then we'll talk a bit about security and some of the tools that can be used to interact with DuraCloud. The final item that we will discuss is some of the roadmap items, both in the short term and the long term for where DuraCloud uh, will likely be going in the future. So just to get us started, DuraCloud, as many of you probably already realize, is both a hosted service and an open source software platform. So what we're going to be talking about today really is the, the open source software that runs in the hosted platform. And that, that hosted software is run on a, a cloud-based compute system, and they connect to cloud-based storage systems in the background and provide a, a level of uh, platform as a service uh, infrastructure for running services over content that, that is stored within DuraCloud. So just to give a, a bit of context for those of you who have used DuraCloud, uh, certainly at the top level here, we have uh, your user data center, which is pointing into DuraCloud, which means that, of course, the content that you have gets backed up into DuraCloud. And there's another piece that you may have interacted with called the DuraCloud Management Console. And that's really the piece that, that we have for uh, working with accounts and, and managing the instances, and the instances being the compute servers that actually run the DuraCloud software. So what we're going to be talking about today is the DuraCloud instance itself, the software that runs there, and the, the pieces and parts that, that make that up. So jumping right in, you're going to see this same picture a few times. And really, it's just showing you a top-level view of the different applications that exist within a DuraCloud instance. So starting with the item that is highlighted in red, the storage management piece, which we call DuraStore, is the first one we're going to talk about. And then we'll move on to service management, which is uh, called DuraService, along with a service container, followed by looking at the report management piece called DuraReport, and finally the administrative user interface called DuraAdmin. So we'll st start right now by looking at the DuraCloud storage piece of the DuraCloud software. So this picture gives you an idea of how that storage piece works, and really the goal of DuraCloud. Uh, storage management is to get the content from the user data center, so from your storage systems into clouds, cloud data centers, cloud storage. And so the, the user data center at the top and the, the cloud storage um, parts on the, the bottom right-hand side there is the, is the flow that we want to see. And, and the large blue box in the center is are the pieces that DuraCloud provides in order to, to make that happen. So you can see, of course, that there are several different uh, cloud storage providers listed on the right here. Amazon S3, Rackspace Cloud Files, Microsoft Azure, and SDSC Cloud. And certainly, there are others on that list. And, um, and some of those have, have come and gone. But these are the, the items that we're actually uh, working on um, most thoroughly today. So Amazon S3 and Rackspace at this point are considered production stores. Uh, the Microsoft Azure and SDSC cloud storage we're considering in, in beta in DuraCloud right at the moment. So in order to get your content into the cloud storage, we need to have ad adapters, which you see um, are pointing into uh, those, those cloud storage centers. And what those adapters do is it translates the information that's coming in uh, through DuraCloud into the language that those cloud providers actually understand. So this is one of the, the major features of DuraCloud. 
in that it allows you to connect with and talk to multiple cloud providers through a single interface. So that interface is the REST API that you see here. So we build each of these adapters in order to uh, do the pieces that are really specific to that storage provider in order to get that data moved in in the appropriate manner and, and stored properly. So sitting right outside of that storage set of storage adapters is the storage provider interface. And really that's just an interface that is applied on top of each of those storage adapters so that we're able to talk to each of those adapters in a consistent way. So that allows us to have a, a consistent methodology above the level of that interface to be able to um, push content down into DuraCloud and it gets persisted in each of these stores. And then the REST API at the top level is the piece that uh, is where you're actually pushing your content. That's the, the layer at which um, primary interaction occurs with the DuraCloud storage system. And whether you're using one of the tools that is provided by DuraCloud or the uh, administrative UI, or you're going directly through the REST API or, um, or using another set of tools, they really all in the end end up going through that REST API. The storage mediation piece is, is really just a, a bit of a um, collector for the information that comes in through the REST API, and then it distributes those calls out to the storage provider interface and to the appropriate storage adapter. And that also handles some of the pieces that are necessary to occur above the level of a specific adapter, such as being able to transfer content from one storage provider to another. So taking a quick look at the REST interface for the storage adapter, um, we are looking at three different pieces here. One is a set of actions that can be taken on a space. And I'll clarify that a space is really just a top level container that allows you to uh, organize the content that you need to store within DuraCloud. So there's a few different things that can be done on a space. Of course, adding the space and deleting the space as well as setting properties, getting the list of uh, the full list of all the spaces as well as the list of all the content in the space and then setting up access control on, at the space level. Looking over at the content actions, this is the set of things that can be done on your content. So of course, adding it and removing it, uh, copying it to another space or copying it such that you can rename it and then uh, getting or setting properties and getting that content back, of course. So that set of space actions and, spe and set of content actions together make up essentially what is the storage provider interface that we talked about just a moment ago. The other actions that are listed on the bottom here, um, one is get stores, which allows you to see the list of storage providers that you actually have hooked up to your DuraCloud. So if you, for instance, have Amazon and Rackspace available through DuraCloud, this gives you a way to see which providers there are and then make uh, calls both for spaces and content that are specific to those providers. The, debt, the get task list and perform task actions are pieces that really just allow us to do work through the providers for services. So we'll be talking about the tasks, tasks in just a little bit. So taking a, another look at the storage adapters, they are, are really intended to allow us to transform the calls that come in through the REST API and push those calls into the specific storage provider. So they are the pieces that determine how our notion of spaces translate into however the storage provider thinks of those of those containers. So certainly in Amazon, they're called buckets, they're called different things in different providers. And that piece allows us to do that inter integration into whatever the storage provider expects us to be talking about. Of course, the, the adapter also defines how the space content and properties are stored. And it's interesting that the space and content properties are, are not consistently stored across different providers. Just each one has their own method for allowing us to store that information. So the storage adapters really give us the, the place to understand what the provider expects and to, to push that into the correct location. And it also 
helps us to manage eventual consistency concerns. And this really just gives us an opportunity to uh, uh, get past some of the uh, uh, concerns that come up when dealing with uh, storage in the cloud. And that is, is primarily a concern that comes in when you are trying to work with data very quickly and you expect content to be available as soon as, as, soon as it is uh, placed in the cloud, which is not always the case. And these storage adapters allow us to understand what the provider can provide to us in terms of guarantees and then work with that to help make it more seamless on the DuraCloud side. So moving right along to the centerpiece here, the service management side of DuraCloud, which we call DuraService. I imagine many of you have already seen or have used many of these services that I'm listing here. And, and as you know, DuraCloud provides a, a set of services that, that is growing as we uh, re recognize that there are more needs out there and we build services. Of course, it's our intention to allow others outside of DuraSpace to be building the services as well. And we're starting to get some uptake on that with some external developers talking about services that they would like to build. But really the question I'd like to look at first is how are these services deployed? So we're gonna step through two different parts of that question. And the first piece of the answer to how a service is deployed is the, the user asking which services are available to them. So that question comes in and is asked of the Dura service piece. And that question then gets handed down to what we call a service registry. The service registry is really the place where we keep a listing of service plans. And within those plans, there are sets of service bundles and service configuration. The service bundles are really the content that's necessary, the files and various other pieces that are necessary to actually run the service. And the configuration is the listing of all the questions that need to be answered in order for the service to be run. So the service registry responds to the question by looking at the service plan of the user and passing back a service list to indicate that these are the services that are available and these are the questions that need to be answered in order to deploy that service. And then of course that gets passed back up to the user. So part two is where the, the user actually passes in the request to deploy a service along with the configuration that has been filled out. And then the Dura service application goes back to the service registry and asks for the service bundle. So it pulls up what is the latest service bundle and passes that along with the service configuration down into the service container. So the service bundle coming from the service registry, the service configuration coming from the user, all of that flows down into the service container. And really this is an OSGI container that is doing the work of both deploying the service and starting it up as well as running the configurator here, which stores the configuration and passes that into the service as soon as it starts. So at that point, the service is started, the con it, it is configured with the right information and it can start doing its work. So looking a bit at the REST interface for the service side, it's pretty simple. You can, of course, get services and deploy services, which are the two things we just talked about. You can also get a list of the deployed services. So this is just getting the information that is coming directly out of Dura service to give you an idea of the, uh, the set of services that are deployed, as well as the configuration that was passed in when that service was deployed. The next piece is getting the properties for a deployed service. And really what that is doing is passing not just through Dura service, but passing all the way down to the service container to get the information about the runtime uh, actual properties of the service. So that's going to include the information about how far along the service is and what its state is at the moment. And then of course, updating the service configuration if something needs to be changed in the way the service is running. And of course, undeploying the service once either it is complete or it no longer needs to be run anymore. So getting back to that list of services that I showed a moment ago, there's actually two different kinds of services that we run in DuraCloud. Uh, one side uh, indicated on the left here 
is the DuraCloud instance services. And these are the services that really do all of their work on the DuraCloud instance. So these services are run by uh, the flow that we just talked about, and they are kicked off in the service container, and they do all of their work there and, and um, then complete. And of course, they connect to DuraStore in order to get access to the content. And there's actually two different kinds of services that can be run this way. One is a direct Java service, which is really just running a set of code over the content that is in your storage area to do a certain amount of work. The other one is a is the ability to run a web application. So a good the the best example here is the image server. So we are running a another um, storage, I mean service container, and starting up that image server within a, a new Tomcat server that is available for people to stream the images coming out of DuraCloud. Looking at the other side, we have a set of DuraCloud distributed services. And by distributed, I mean that some of the work for that DuraCloud service is done on the DuraCloud instance, but really the majority of it is done externally on another system. And primarily, these are connecting to the storage and service compute platforms of other um, cloud providers. So things like uh, the uh, CloudFront capability of Amazon, as well as the Elastic MapReduce capability of Amazon, both to do streaming and to do uh, bulk service activities. So this steps up the flow a little bit that we talked about a moment ago. So certainly we've already gone through items or steps one, two, three, and four here, which gets the service into a container in order to get it running. Steps five and six are new though, and that is the separate pieces that are necessary to run an external or a distributed service within DuraCloud. So step five is actually calling a service task. As we mentioned a little bit ago, there is a, an ability on the REST API of DuraStore to make a call to indicate that a task needs to be run. And one of those tasks is to run a job in Hadoop uh, through Elastic MapReduce, which is provided by Amazon. So once the service is, is in the service container, then it makes the call through that task management piece of DuraStore to start the job up in, in Hadoop. And what that's really doing is starting a series of, of servers that are managed by Amazon and it pulls the information from DuraStore and, and, and is able to distribute the work among all of those servers in order to provide the, the best throughput for getting that job done in a reasonable time frame. So stepping right through to the report management side, so this is called Dura Report. This is the, the third major piece of what is running on your DuraCloud instance. So there's really two sides to the report management in, uh, in DuraCloud. One side is, is handling what is going on with regard to services, and the other side is what is going on with regard to storage. So starting on the right-hand side here, the service management piece in DuraCloud, whenever an event occurs, and that event can be the starting of a new service, the reconfiguration of a service, the stopping of a service, or the completion of a service, among other things. Whenever one of those events occurs, uh, a message is sent, uh, which goes through the message broker, which is a piece of DuraCloud. And that's sent up to a service report builder within the Dura report application. And what that report builder is doing is just listening for all those messages and building up a list of, of them in order to indicate what's been going on and how services are running. So it keeps track not only of the events, but as soon as, say, a service is deployed, it picks up the configuration of the service and gives just a really, really a runtime listing of everything that's happening with regard to running services within DuraCloud. On the storage side, this, this piece is instead of running um, in the same way as uh, services, it's, it, it is set up to run on a schedule. So currently, uh, the, the default schedule is a weekly storage report being run. 
And what this does is it makes calls from DuraPort down into the storage management piece, the Dura store, and asks for the complete list of content from every space. And it builds up a report based on touching every piece of uh, content in order to know what's there and how large it is, what type of content it is. And then it pulls out all that information together and lets you see it in a way that gives you a drill down from the very top level, looking at the storage providers and then stepping down into uh, each of the spaces to see what kind of content you have, how much is there, and um, and the number of, of items that you're dealing with. And of all of this information built by DuraReport, both the storage and the service pieces get pushed down through the storage management side into DuraStore. So those are persisted for you and read out in order to display. So looking at the REST interfaces for the report side, uh, there's quite a few things that can be done here. On the storage side, uh, primarily, there's the ability to start and stop a, a storage report and start and stop this, uh, or, I mean, uh, set up the schedule of a storage report or cancel the schedule of a, of a storage, storage report. So you can, if you'd like to run storage reports, say, on a biweekly basis or on a daily basis, you can set that up in order to run um, however you'd like. And you can also get the list of all storage reports that have been run in the past and all of the storage, and then get each one individually. On the service report side, there is the ability to just get the latest uh, information about st service reports. And actually, service reports are uh, are cut into month-by-month -month sets, so you can get the list of the the month-to-month -month, uh, service, report, service reports and get any individual report that you'd like to see. So the last piece that is the, the major section of DuraCloud is the administrative user interface, which we call DuraAdmin. And this is actually quite simple. There's a, a user interface that sits um, kind of above all the other applications. And it uses the storage client, which is just a Java client that we make available, as well as the service client and the report client, all Java clients, to make calls down into uh, Dura Store for storage management, Dura Service for service management, and Dura Report for report management. And really what it does is just display the information that it's able to collect through uh, those REST APIs, as well as allow you to make changes in those applications. One of the good points about this is that if you are interested in building an interface into DuraCloud, any one of these pieces, you have the ability to get all of the information and do the same kinds of activities that the UI for DuraCloud currently does. It's all available through the REST APIs. So stepping out of the applications for a moment and looking at DuraCloud security, there are several different parts to DuraCloud security, but we'll start by looking at the base level on the far left here. We have the storage provider, and this, of course, can be any one of the providers that we connect to. But each one has its own capability for setting access control. So what we really do is set the access control for all the content that's stored in all of our storage providers in order to allow access only to a single user, and that user is DuraCloud. That way, there is no way for anyone to get access to any of the content through any other means except coming through DuraCloud. Moving over to the right, that's the instance of DuraCloud that we've been talking about. And each of the applications that we've mentioned so far, uh, DuraAdmin, DuraStore, DuraService, and DuraReport, each have their own uh, set of application security, which just means that any user that is interested in, in working with the content there must authenticate and then must be authorized to see that content or, or change that content before that anything can actually be uh, done on that content or it can be read. Just outside of the instance, there is a firewall that is managed by the compute side of the DuraCloud instance. And that firewall is, is really just set up to allow only transfer into and out of DuraCloud through a, a secure means. So as it's mentioned at the bottom piece here, there is transport security set up as well, which means that we're using SSL to ensure that there is encryption occurring on the content that is moved from your, the user data center into DuraCloud. 
and the firewall is guaranteeing that that's the only way that content can be moved into DuraCloud. So there's really just a lot of pieces to the security um, setup of DuraCloud, but we are certainly doing the best we can to ensure that the content that moves in is secure and is cannot be accessed by anyone who is not authorized. Now we're going to look just briefly at the tools that are available uh, to connect with DuraCloud. There's a set of tools here on the left for transferring content into DuraCloud, and on the right-hand side is a set of uh, tools that are available for getting content out of DuraCloud. So on the left side, the, 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 the top tool here is the upload tool, which is a graphical, which provides a graphical interface for selecting files and folders. And once those are selected, you can watch a visual progress meter show you how those files are getting moved up. Now, the upload tool is really using a lot of the pieces of the next tool, which is the sync tool. And the sync tool is primarily set up to be run by administrators in order to um, do command line operations. And the, the sync tool can actually be run either as a one time, uh, which is how it's used in the upload tool, or at, on a continual basis. So you can set the sync tool up to continually monitor a set of folders within your file system so that anytime anything changes, those changes get pushed up to DuraCloud. The chunk tool on the bottom is integrated into the sync tool. And really what it allows for is files that are very large, meaning files that are over a gigabyte, to be split up into multiple files so that they can transfer cleanly into DuraCloud. And the chunk tool really acts on a single file at a time in a command line kind of fashion. So that's why it's integrated into the sync tool to allow for a greater level of capability. On the other side, transferring your content back out of DuraCloud so that you can get it back to your local system, we have the retrieval tool, which retrieves files similar to the way the, the sync tool pushes files up. And so the retrieval tool can be set up to select from one or more or all spaces in your DuraCloud instance and all of those all those files, all the content items that are in those spaces get pulled back down to your, your local file system. The stitch tool uh, is the corollary to the chunk tool. So any file that gets split on the way into DuraCloud gets put back together on the way back out of DuraCloud so that the content items that you pushed into DuraCloud from your system come back to your system looking exactly the same. So this is just a, a picture to illustrate the, the series of tools that I just talked about. So on the left-hand side, we have the upload tool, which mostly encompasses the, the work of the, of the sync tool, which encompasses the chunk tool, and they all use the store client. On the right-hand side, uh, the retrieval tool encompasses the stitch tool, and that also uses the, the store client in order to get content back from the DuraStore application into the local uh, data store. So now we're just going to talk a little bit about the uh, items that are coming down the road for DuraCloud. There are several new features as well as several integrations uh, that we have planned. And uh, just walking through this list, the, the first item here is access control at the space level. And really what that means is that currently there is uh, the, the setup that anyone who has the ability to log into a DuraCloud instance can see the content that's available um, in all the spaces within DuraCloud. So this provides us with the uh, ability to uh, uh, set up users and groups to be able to access only certain spaces. And this is something that we've been asked for uh, for universities that want to provide um, maybe researchers or departments with different areas of their DuraCloud account to be able to store their content. Of course, improved formatted identification just gives us a better understanding of the, the content that's coming into DuraCloud. Currently, there's a, a fairly simplistic model in place for determining the content coming into DuraCloud based on the file extension. And this is intending to use some tools like Droid and Fits to be able to better understand what's coming into DuraCloud so that we can tag it 
um, with a, a more appropriate properties and uh, MIME types. Automated bit integrity checking uh, will give us the ability to run uh, bit integrity checking and, and really down the road have more uh, different kinds of services in automated fashion. So it's not something that the user will need to kick off or monitor or, or really deal with in, in any particular way. It's something that will just happen in the background. Certainly there's an interest that we've seen in getting notifications for services that are that have completed as well as email notifications for a variety of other activities. So it's on the plan to um, pull those in and just make it possible to provide better information coming out of DuraCloud. So multi-account DuraCloud instances is actually uh, giving us the opportunity to potentially lower the prices of the DuraCloud, of running the DuraCloud instance by putting together uh, several different users' uh, accounts onto a single compute server. So there would certainly still be a complete separation of the content and there would still be a complete separation of the management and, and access of all of the information and, and data and activity in those DuraCloud uh, accounts, but they would be able to run on a single server so that the overall cost of running DuraCloud would be able to come down somewhat. Of course, content indexing and search will just provide for us a, a greater degree of discovery and, and browsing ability uh, which is just uh, in general something that we've we've heard a lot of interest in being able to um, have a better understanding of the data that's in DuraCloud and be able to, to find it more easily. Folder-based navigation is is primarily a um, uh, just a way to uh, provide for a standard uh, folder uh, browsing view uh, of the content in DuraCloud. It's currently possible to uh, store content in DuraCloud that has a, a folder-based structure, but it's the, the user interface does not display it in that way at the moment. And uh, we've certainly been working with large files for a while, and we just have an interest in, in continuing to improve our capability of handling the very large files in terms of streaming and in terms of um, uh, combining those files for use in a variety of ways. And the multi-item update and delete is another uh, just convenience for being able to work with your data in, in a simpler fashion. Getting down to integrations, we've already actually have an SDSC storage provider, but we're considering it in, in a beta version at this moment. So as we continue to work with SDSC and continue to do some testing on that provider, we will move that into production a couple of integrations that a lot of people have shown interest in is being able to run either Fedora or DSpace in the cloud. And so our, our plan is in the short term to produce pro prototypes for both of those integrations, which will allow us to simply run both a Fedora and a DSpace in the cloud connected to DuraCloud so that people will be able to um, push the, both the content and the, the operation of running those repository systems into the cloud. Looking out a little bit further, there's several items on the, on the roadmap uh, that we can't really fit in as quickly as we'd like, but are still things that we feel are important. Things like video transcoding, which is something that we're working on actually at the moment in a pilot group with WGBH and MIT. And we've been getting a lot of good feedback from them regarding the kinds of transcoding that are necessary and the formats and encodings that, that will be the most useful. Um, we also, along that vein, would like to step into more uh, document format transformation. So being able to handle the kinds of archival tasks that tend to come up very often uh, in, in uh, both institutions and uh, just individually for people who are working with uh, a large variety of, of format types and being able to move those into uh, more current format types is is something that uh, is very important. So along with that, of course, it's also um, being able to handle uh, certain kinds of files, in this case, images, uh, but certain kinds of files that uh, can have particular types of views 
that uh, just make them more useful for everyone that uh, would like to have access to them. So we want to improve our capabilities for doing for dealing with images for both serving and and uh, transforming them into into various things. The media streaming uh, capability already exists, but one thing we'd like to do is add a level of access control over those uh, over that service to make it uh, just generally more useful for those who'd like to use uh, the streaming capability but uh, aren't using video that is uh, just widely available. The metadata extraction services note here is is really um, just using some of the tools that already exist to uh, to be able to pull more information out of the the data that we're already getting so that we can provide better meta metadata which will lead to better uh, indexing and better searching down the road. So some of the integrations uh, in the in the longer term uh, map are uh, looking at Azure from a storage provider perspective. We already have a an integration there, but again, it's it's in beta version, and we've been in talks with them about some of the the work that they have in in their plan, and we'll be able to hopefully get to a production version for for the Azure integration very soon after the new year. The Eucalyptus Walrus storage provider is something that we actually started during the Google Summer of Code this last summer uh, with, with a graduate student who was interested in making that integration happen. And, I, and, and we got a long way, and, but we're not, we're not, and that's not really complete yet. So this integration is really just finishing up that work and, and making it available. Racks-based compute instances are just allowing for the, the running of DuraCloud in its entirety on Rackspace because right now we, we currently run on Amazon and certainly our intention is to be able to be uh, storage and compute agnostic in terms of what DuraCloud is and how it runs. So there's nothing that's really stopping us from making the move for, to Rackspace um, as an alternative uh, except for the time it would take to uh, do the testing. And then uh, finally, the the Fedora and DSpace and the cloud capability we'd like to get to is being able to really run a completely managed Fedora and DSpace in the cloud, meaning that DuraCloud is able to start and stop and, and manage the compute servers that the Fedora and DSpace need to run on. And it just frees up the repository managers from having to deal with upgrades, from having to deal with uh, some of the other maintenance work that comes along with running an institutional repository. And that's really all I had for the technical overview of DuraCloud at this point. I'd like to open the floor up for questions. Okay, hey, right now everybody's phone line is going to be coming off of mute. So if you could please go ahead and mute your own personal line, unless of course you have a question. I will go ahead and start our question answer session off from a question with Rick. Um, Bill, does the BitChecker service run in whatever cloud storage you are using, or does it check remotely? So currently, the the Bit Integrity Checker um, runs within Amazon. So for the content that's in Amazon, it certainly is running locally. But for all of the content that's in, uh, say, Rackspace or one of the other providers, it is actually pulling would would need to pull the content over into Amazon in order to do that check. So that's one of the reasons why we have an interest in moving uh, our capability for for doing compute in other uh, compute providers to be able to pair the, those kind of services with the storage in order to run them in a more efficient manner. Thank you. Can you also elaborate on how the chunk and stitch tools guarantee integrity of the process of taking files apart and putting them back together? Sure. So sure. when a, a when the chunker runs, what it's actually doing is uh, pushing through uh, a, a stream of, of bits, and as it gets to the the bit that uh, is the the total for the you know the size that you're wanting to chunk at, it um, takes it splits off that piece and takes a um, a checksum of that of that section um, at the beginning. Of course, it takes a checksum of the entire file, and then as it runs through, 
uh, you end up with a checksum for each piece that gets pushed up to DuraCloud, as well as the, um, as I mentioned, the, the uh, checksum for the entire file. So that all ends up in a manifest for, uh, for that file, which lists all the pieces. It lists the, the um, checksum for each part. And then uh, the stitcher tool on the other side pulls down each piece and checks against the, the checksum that uh, was generated by the, the chunker tool. And um, once the file is completely put back together, it checks the, the complete checksum in order to guarantee that the file that was put up is the same file that was pulled back down. OK. And regarding multi-accounts, um, you mentioned that this would allow multiple users to use the same DuraCloud instance. So the question is, will DuraCloud or does DuraCloud support using multiple instances of the same type of storage provider? So for example, will you be able to replicate between AWS and two different IRODS providers? So we, we actually have worked on um, some IRODS providers um, as far as a storage provider integration with DuraCloud. Of course, that's, that's not the question exactly, but it's certainly possible within DuraCloud uh, to be able to run against multiple of the same type of uh, a storage provider. So we have run, run experimental DuraCloud instances against, say, multiple uh, S3 uh, storage providers so that we could say, copy files from one S3 account to another. Um, so that's certainly possible. It, it's not really something that we offer at the moment in the hosted um, capability of DuraCloud just because we haven't been asked for it. So if that's something that is, is really a need, we can certainly, certainly take a look at uh, wanting to do that. Thank you. And who is hosting the supporting architecture behind DuraCloud? The supporting architecture, well, so the, the work that's done so far is, is really all, all been done by DuraSpace uh, as far as the, the software development that has happened, as far as where the, the services actually run, the instances um, they run currently on Amazon's EC2 network. And as I mentioned, uh, our intention is to be able to run that on multiple compute networks. Are there any live questions out there? Please feel free to ask Bill your question. And if you're shy, you certainly can submit it in the chat. Okay, Bill, as we wait for um, another question to come in, can you go ahead and turn to the next slide, please? Sure. Just wanted to make mention of two more upcoming DuraCloud webinars that we will be offering. On November 30th at 1 o'clock Eastern time, we will be presenting the DSpace and DuraCloud webinar. And at the beginning of the year on January 11th, we'll be talking more about Fedora and DuraCloud. So you will be receiving information regarding these two webinars. Um, next week, we'll be providing you with the opportunity to start signing up for the DSpace and DuraCloud webinar. And at the beginning of the new year, the information will be released for the Fedora and DuraCloud webinar. And I have yet another question. Can you go into the cost structure at all? Um, actually, I'd like to uh, pass that question to Michelle, who I believe is on the call. Um, she has yep. been doing a lot of work with setting up the cost structure for DuraCloud. Yep, I'm on the call. So we offer DuraCloud as a managed service, as I think um, many of you understood from this presentation. So when you're purchasing or subscribing to your DuraCloud account, there's basically two components of that cost. One is a subscription fee, and that's a monthly or an annual fee, depending on if you want to sign up for a one-year subscription or a monthly subscription. That subscription fee covers the compute cost for running your DuraCloud instance, and it covers the cost for us internally to manage that instance, provide the upgrades, and make sure your DuraCloud instance is always running. And that cost is um, basically somewhere between 3000 and 6000 a year, depending on what 
um, type of services you enable in your DuraCloud account. The second cost is the storage cost. And the storage cost depends on how much content you put in. You get um, the first uh, half a terabyte included in your subscription fee. And then after that, it's uh, roughly, it's $1,000 per terabyte annually per year. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah. So uh, there are actually a couple questions um, on the chat that were directed to me directly um, from Adam Soroka. So I'll answer a couple of those at this point. Um, he asks, are there configurations actually being maintained in the OSGI configuration administration service? So the answer there, Adam, is yes. Um, the configuration of the actually de of, of the deployed service is maintained within the um, OSGI configuration admin service. And that's how we, we transition from getting the, the configuration in and passing it to the OSGI bundle that is running um, in the container. Uh, another question is, uh, is the message broker a custom built DuraCloud component or is it an off the shelf part like ActiveMQ? Um, it is in fact ActiveMQ um, specifically uh, that runs that piece. Bill, for the service plan, how are the bundle and configurations determined? I think that's something that um, we have looked at in terms of what people are needing and the kinds of um, services that tend to go together in, in those groups of, uh, and, and we sort of try to group together the, the kinds of services that, that tend to make sense in a grouping um, in terms of the service plans. Um, that's really more of a, a a business decision than it is a technical decision in terms of um, which services fall into which plan. Yeah, so I'll, I'll chime in a little bit. There's a the archiving and preservation really has all of the services that you would care about for archiving and checking your content. The access and media really focuses on um, viewing and streaming of the content. And the pro, what we call the pro subscription, has all the services available. Um, and those were just some initial, based on some analysis we did, we thought the way that people would want to use it. But, you know, it's, it's still in development, I'd say, depending on what we see the, the true use cases are. And at any time you have a DuraCloud account, you can, you can just let us know if you want a service turned on that's not available. It's a, really the click of a button. If we have participants who are interested in keeping up with the Eucalyptus Walrus storage provider integration, do you have a place um, where they can learn more and find out more information about it? Well, I'd say certainly if you're interested in um, being part of the work, um, get in touch with us in, in terms of you know, what your capabilities are and how you might be able to help, because we certainly would appreciate that. Um, in terms of keeping up with the development that's happening on our side, I'd say uh, mostly just keeping up with um, the the information that gets sent out uh, from uh, from Duraspace in, in terms of the releases. So you'll be able to see you know the the pieces that fall in. There's also um, a Jira item, which is our issue tracker that specifically calls out the um, Eucalyptus Walrus storage integration. So if you want to um, take a look at that, you can vote for it and uh, put any comments in there uh, to give us, if you have more information about the way you use Eucalyptus Walrus uh, at your local institution, it would be helpful to understand what the use cases look like at this, at this point. Any other questions out there for Bill or Michelle? We have one here in chat. XAC ML policy enforcement object and or repository would need to be implemented locally. So exactly policy enforcement, that's that's going to be in terms of the Fedora instance. If you're running a uh, Fedora um, in the cloud, and that's something we, we actually haven't completely worked out yet in terms of um, the policy enforcement. We don't actually use Zacmel for DuraCloud. That's why I make that clarification. 
um, it's it's a much simpler setup for DuraCloud intending uh, to allow you to to do, run something like Fedora that sits on top. It seems likely um, that you would need to uh, you know define your example and push it into the Fedora that's running um, in the cloud in order for that to be uh, able to to act correctly in terms of the policy enforcement that you have in place. If you want to use Exactful um, with DuraCloud um, directly, then yes, that's something you need to need to either work with us to implement or um, or implement on on your own locally um, at, as something that sits in front of DuraCloud. So another question from from oh, Adam. Um, I see that he's asking: um, Is the information and access to manage services also available directly in the OSGI container without relying on DuraCloud abstractions? So could I provision the container with another admin UI like Felix and use that to effectively interact with DuraCloud services? So the the answer is yes and no. Um, one of the capability, one of the requirements for a DuraCloud service is that. It, it does implement a particular um, interface. So as long as the, the service implements the appropriate interface that DuraCloud is expecting, then you would be able to interact with them directly, say through Felix or uh, um, whichever OSGI container you're using. Um, you'd be able to deploy a service and undeploy a service with that, um, uh, you know, into that container and and still be able to allow DuraCloud to interact with it. Of course, DuraCloud would need to know about it, um, but you could you could still see what's there and interact with it in some ways. Okay, Bill, any parting words of wisdom for us? Um, if you have further questions or if there's more information that I didn't cover that you'd like to cover, certainly uh, pass those questions along to info at duracloud.org and we'll try to get back to you as soon as we can with um, an answer to your question. Um, I certainly appreciate everyone spending the time with us today to learn more about DuraCloud and I, I hope this has been helpful. Okay, on behalf of everybody at DuraSpace and Thank you, Bill, for being our presenter today. And on behalf of everybody at DuraSpace, thank you, all of you, for joining us today. Please enjoy the rest of your afternoon.